Uh, dear viewers and listeners, greetings to you in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Like we always say, today is the day the Lord has made. And we shall be glad and rejoice in it. We welcome you to today's Bible study. Where we continue this wonderful journey as we look at the book of Revelation and see what the Spirit is unveiling to us in our time. Before we drive into the word of God, let's bow our heads and let's dedicate this moment in prayer. Precious Lord, we thank you. Yes, Lord. We receive your word with meekness. Have your way in us, Heavenly Father. We submit to your Lordship and to the authority of the scriptures in our life. Let your word be made manifest in our lives. We worship you, King of Glory. Bless your word and the hearers of your word today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 17. And today we we'll look at the third part in our endeavor to unmask the woman that we find in Revelation chapter 17. Let's read. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowels came and talked with me saying to me come I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy. Having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having in her hand a golden cup full of abomination and the faithness of her fornication. On her forehead a name was written. Mystery. Echama. Babylon the Great, Babylon Echinene. the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the, of the beast that carries her. Which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not. And will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel. Whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is 
the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has yet to come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. But they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind. They will give their authority and power to the beast. These will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the heart sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages, or tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hurt the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast. Until the words of God are fulfilled, the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. May the word of the Lord be blessed. We have a wonderful description again. But like I began last week, often when you read the commentaries that talk about this subject. They often miss what is important. <coughs> what this chapter is all about. We have two principles here. One is the woman and the other is the beast. These are the principal players in this chapter. Yet, when you read so many of the commentaries that come through, they often leave out the woman talk about the ten homes, talk about the cities and leave what is factual here which is which the whole scripture is all about unveiling this hidden principle let me take you back as to why we want to unveil this woman. Say, I at some times do shop online. And as a result of that, you take time and you read the reviews of the people who have purchased or utilized this item that you want to purchase. You, you take some time, you read extensively on the channel or the site which you want to purchase from. And why do you do that? Because 
you want to make sure that what you're doing is the right thing. You don't want to be taken for a ride with your hard-earned money. However, even with all that care, some of us who would do transact online have had our fair share of setbacks. Sometimes you look at something that looks beautiful. You go ahead and purchase it. Only to realize it is not exactly, it doesn't exactly look like what it was on the screen. Sometimes you ask for a refund. And the refund takes long or never comes to you. Sometimes we get to incalosis as a result. Because they advert. And what you see are two different things altogether. You see, as, as much as this has happened, and I know we, some of us refuse to admit it, but it is possible to fall prey to a scam or a lie. And sometimes the consequences are devastating. Now that is what happens in the physical world. I want you to consider how about the spiritual realm? What would be the consequences? It would be if you fail to a spiritual scam. The consequences will be devastating. The consequences will be eternal. And I believe that is why we need to go back to this chapter. And see who this woman is. Whose sole role is to seduce the world. And try to lure the people who try to find security and meaning in the beast. We have seen previously the Bible giving us clue concerning this woman. Number one, chapter 17 calls this woman the great harlot. All the great prostitute. Now, that means this relationship is all wrong. This, in terms of worship, is worship gone wrong. It calls for an illegitimate relationship. So when the Bible portrays this woman as a prostitute, it is trying to show you that whatever is happening here is illegitimate. However beautiful it may look. Secondly, the Bible tells us that this woman sits on many waters. Verse 15 explains to us that these waters represent nations. They represent people. They represent languages. So they represent people of all sorts of life, walks of life, who have come to believe the scam. The Bible says also, in verse 1 and verse 2 that with her the kings of the earth committed adultery. That means the influence is top down. It is not just the people in mass that are lured. But this woman has found a way of even reaching out to the hierarchies 
of life. To the various people and brought them under her influence. The Bible also tells us that the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her daughters. You have seen a drunken person walking. They, they don't have, they are not in the right frame of mind. They cannot make the correct judgment decisions. They cannot think properly. Their walk is never the straight walk. Often when there is an operation to try and get people who are driving under influence. They will often tell you to walk or stand and on one leg. And often if you are under the influence, you will not be able to do some of these exercises they tell you. I recall one time I was stopped. I was coming from an overnight. And so the officer was a little distance away from me. He was under the impression that at 4 a.m. Everybody who is on the road should be under driving under influence. So when he told me to stand on one leg, I stood on one leg. So he asked me, where are you coming from? I said, officer, I'm coming from church. Then he said, why didn't you tell me that before? Instead of wasting my time. So he was so annoyed. Because there was nothing to... I wasn't his target. His target was somebody else. He was looking for people who are intoxicated. Now the role of this woman is to intoxicate. Like with wine. Of how many adulteries. Of how many adulteries. So she will use so many facets. To be able to lure people under her web. And we will look at that in detail. Then the Bible tells us that this woman is sitting on the scarlet beast. The implication of that is this. It is the beast that will bring this woman to preeminence. So she will get to that position through the agency of the beast. Remember the beast has the ten horns. So which the Bible tells us are rulers. So this beast will use the political connections to be able to usher this woman who is a religious figure or a religious system. So we see a religious system that is ushered by an economic political system. So using a political, social, economic system, this religious system is ushered into an era of preeminence. The Bible gives us a description about her dressing. And says she is dressed in purple and scarlet. This is very intriguing. Because when you read the Bible, you're going to see the purple coming through. First you will see it with Rahab. As she lowered the spies, down the wall of Jericho. You see the same color coming up within the tent 
Nanji ya full full of meeting. E koma onera mu weme yense sinkano. Talk pointing to the royalty of God. Gacho gira kubula angiro bwa katonda. We see that coming again. Nera vachidamu. When Jesus was arrested. Nga Yesu wa mukut. And they put a scarlet and purple robe on him. Ne wa mwamba ze chambale cha furungu. Echi miufu kuzye. And then declared him as king. Ne wa muita antiyo ye kabaka. In that moment of shame, the king of the universe was revealed to the world as the king. Now we see it again. This time, the woman dressed in the same color. Now there is something here that I want you to see. I told you the, the devil has tried to mimic whatever represents Christ. And the objective is to set up an earthly kingdom. Why? Because he knows that Jesus will come and he will establish an earthly kingdom. He believes and thinks that by setting one before, then he will hinder the coming in place of the kingdom of God. But like we see in scripture, that will not happen. We also see this woman dressed in God, precious stones and pearls. It is glitter and glamour all over the place. And therefore, the Bible tells us we should not be carried away by, by all the glitter, by things that shine. Not, not, see, not everything that glitters points to divinity. No. We should learn, the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. These are the children of God. So we should allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. We should not allow our inclination to what we see to, to drive us that way. Remember, looking at the surface was the reason man fell in the first place. The Bible tells us when Eve saw that the fruit was good. She was captivated by what she saw. And the spiritual implication we are living with up to today. So let us not be captivated by everything that we see. Allow the Spirit of God to be the leader to open the eyes of your understanding to what is happening right before you. The Bible also tells us concerning this woman that she held a, a golden cup in her hand. And this thread compares with the cup Jesus lifted up. At the last supper. This looks like the other. But it depends on which hand it is. Yes, they may be cups. But whose hand is it in? When Jesus lifted up the cup, he said, this cup. He didn't say all cups. This cup. And he said, do this in memory of me. Now here we have the woman with the cup in her hand. Which speaks to a covenant in itself. But it's not the other covenant. The Bible talks about this cup. And what it is filled, he say it is filled with the abomination, both things, 
and the faith of her adulteries. Egambe chikombe chomuka chiju devi interview of vozi ne mpitambie yobu enziwe. In other words, whatever is there is distasteful in the eyes of God. Bionevi ni mchikombe chobi intu vuvozi mumaso gakato. Whatever it represents is something that God hates. God calls it an abomination. That is a very heavy word. Number nine, the Bible says on her forehead there is this inscription. Bab Mystery Babylon the Great. Echama Babylon Echinene. And that we say that means it is deeper. It talks about Babylon. But Babylon is bigger than what we think it is. When you take the thread of Babylon, you take it back to Genesis at the Tower of Babel. And when you bring it forward to the time of the physical Babylonian Empire, and come to Daniel 2 at the statue. And the image of what represented the great dynasties that will come after Babylon. You will see that though it looks like Babylon went away. But you don't see Babylon destroyed. Spiritually, this comes back as the Roman Empire. And then we see it now arise spiritually with this woman. I want you to see something that I did not mention earlier. The Bible talks about this woman as seated on many waters. Then we see this woman seated on the beast. Revelation 13 Verse 1 tells us that this beast comes out of the waters. This beast comes out of the waters on which this woman is actually sitting. So then this beast is responsible for ushering this woman along with the ten into the place of preeminence. I think you see where this is all coming from coming through. So for you to understand how this is falling in place, you need to backtrack. Go back to Romans. I go back to Revelation chapter 13. Then suddenly this becomes much clearer to you. I, I know some scholars have said the beast and the the woman are the same. They are not. That is erroneous. The it's woman it's is different from the beast. The beast is carrying the woman. And the Bible is very clear in trying to separate the two. Let's go on. The Bible talks about this one woman as the mother of prostitutes or the mother of harlots. That means whatever she is doing is not in isolation. I told you this represents a religious system. And from it, many other systems are going to come through in order to be able to spread these abominations. On the surface, it looks like worship that God desires. Worship that pleases God. Yet, from what we see, because at this point, John is in the spirit. 
at kati wano chetu watu laga yokana ba mtu wala mumoyo neba mulaka. And whatever he's seen is under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Bili wansi woku lunga mizi wako mwoyo mtu kuku. It is a like God telling John this is not pleasing to me. So this is not just a message for John to bring to us. This is a message to open our eyes. To understand that there is one, a kind of worship that is not pleasing to God. Number 10, we saw another clue that she was drunk with the blood of the saints. The blood of those who bore the testimony to Jesus. Now this is very profound because when John saw this, he was astonished. He could not believe what he was seeing and it had to take the angel to explain how this would come about. Now, having looked at all this, we added up all the pieces and identified who this woman was. For the Bible tells us that this woman is a city seated on seven hills. And we identify that as Rome. So we then had the interpretation correctly. Because this woman represents a church. But this church is a religious system. And it is not the church of Jesus Christ. Hope that registers in your mind. So having understood that. And having identified this woman. We then get to a point. Where I want us to break it all down for us. What does this mean to us today? It tells us a number of things concerning the end time. Number one, there will be a final one world religion. And when you look at the trends of the times, they are drawing us closer ever somewhere to this. Ecumenical approach. So that everything points to this one religion. This chapter also points us to the identity of who Babylon is. And we have discussed that exhaustively. This chapter also tells us and provides the identity of the Antichrist and what he will do and how he will use the woman to be able to achieve his end. And after he has, the woman has accomplished her purpose. The Bible tells us in verse 16 and 17. Then the beast and the ten horns are going to gang up against the woman. They're going to humiliate her. They are going to strip her naked. They are going to burn her. Now they're going to annihilate her completely. Look at this. It also gives us the order of how these empires are going to show up. And how the events are coming into place. Now, chapter 17 is a very interesting one. Because it comes on the back of chapter 16. In chapter 16, we saw how all the satanic forces 
of darkness are going to be destroyed. Now, chapter 17 is like taking a back shot to explain in detail who the chief protagonists are in this in this whole conquest. So John here is now showing us how all this will come into play. Remember when this when we were beginning the book of Revelation, this was the message to us. In verse 3, the Bible says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. So there is read, soma, hear, and then heed. So very important principles that we need to see from there. So now, having understood this, what I find astonishing is the fact that when we mention who Babylon actually is, or who the woman is. A lot of people shy away from this. Why? Because history is painted with what exactly has happened. Rome has been responsible for all the threats of to the Christian church as we know it. And it is, it is this Rome that did melt into what we call the Papal Rome today. From the time of Constantine. And that is how we have all these robes coming into the church. That is how we have all the artifacts coming in. That is how we have all the things that were out of place suddenly finding their way into the church. It is wrong. That consigned the people to death in names of crusades. When we look at the Inquisition, we see so many people martyred for their faith. When we come to the Dark Ages, the principal author of the death there was wrong. When it came to people being murdered for trying to translate the Bible, men like John Haas burnt alive. Tindale. Why? Because the chief protagonist at protagonist at the end of the day was wrong. So this is not far-fetched. This is something that we have lived with. And so when you look at all the riches, when you look at all the power that is there, it all points to the Roman Catholic Church. This is Babylon. And this is the reason why John was shocked. So we shouldn't be shocked too. We now understand what this is all about. So having looked at that, let's go, let's go further and see the big picture now. You see, if you look at Jeremiah 50 and 51 and take it and look at Daniel 
And then add them together with this text that we just read. Then you have the complete picture of how this all comes up. Now, you may say, what is it that you have against the Catholic Church? Absolutely nothing. My heart pleads for them. But let's look at some facts. Where do they miss it? And I will just mention a few. One. Matthew chapter 23 verse 9. The Bible says, Do not call anyone on earth father. For one is your father. He who is in heaven. Who says these words? Jesus Christ. What is the instruction of the church to call their priests? Father. The claim to, of the power to forgive sins compared to what Jesus said Mark chapter 2 verse 7 he say, ask the question, who can forgive sins? But God alone. Even the Pharisees knew that. So what is this absolute ab going, what is this about forgiving sins? The bowing before statues. <clears throat> now this has also crept into all other, really, most of other Faith. It's, it is idolatry that is going to various lengths. It goes beyond the statues. It goes to men and women. And we end up apportioning the worship that is supposed to be to God, to men. What does Exodus 24 to 5 tell us? It says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not bow down to them. This Strangely enough, goes out of the catechism. When you read it, or the way it is taught, what is it te teaching us about being saved by faith? They say you must be, you are saved by faith and works. But what does Ephesians? Chapter 2, 8 to 9 tell us. It says, For by grace right. you have been saved through faith. And, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. The teaching about purgatory which is contrary to what the Bible teaches. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. The Bible states that we are confident. Yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when we are absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. And there is no transitional place. The teaching of the Catholic Church is that the Pope is the head of the church. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. The Bible talks about Christ. And says is the head of the body. The church. The teaching about Mary. That she remained a virgin for life, which is not consistent with Mark chapter 6 verse 3. The Bible tells us and the people were wondering when Jesus spoke so boldly with such wisdom 
They said, is not this the carpenter? The son of Mary. And the brother of James. Joseph. Joseph, Judas, Judas, and Simon, ne Simone, are not his sisters here with us. Never, never Ganda Catholicism refers to Mary as the Queen of Heaven. But look at Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 18. This is what the Bible tells us. Prophetically, God is speaking. And says the children gather wood. The fathers kindle the fire. And the women need dough. To make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. The, the Catholic Church teaches people that they ought to pray to Mary and the saints. But look at what 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 tells us. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It forbids bishops to marry and priests. But look at what First Timothy tells us. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good, good work. A bishop must then be blameless and a husband of one wife. It teaches that certain foods are not to be eaten on certain days. Like meat during the time of fasting on Wednesday and Friday. But look at what the Bible says. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 3. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits. And, and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own consciences seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God has created to be received. With thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Have we looked at all these facts? Let's look at the commercialization of the gospel. Where does it have its roots from? It comes from the Catholic Church. Now, this has swept across, taking us back to the mother of Harlots that we talked about. So when you trace this back, it has its roots in the Dark Ages. It has its roots in Babylon. So where does that lead you and I? What is it that we must look at? The fact is, the times are going to get worse. It is not going to get any easier. And this information is very important for you, the saint, today. Because God has called you not to walk in darkness, but to walk in light. The book of Revelation comes for us to be able to see 
For us to be able to understand the times that we are living in. And for us to be able to be built by this word. And avoid to fall to the scam. We have attempted to speak this truth in love. Humbly and to point out this truth that are so open to us. Yes, at times we have appeared a little strong. But these are facts that cannot be ignored. You as a Christian have been warned. We need to heed to that warning. Why? Because right now, the wheat and the tears are growing together. And it is possible for the tears to choke the wheat from being productive. The truth that we find here should warn us to be alert to what is truth and understand that the tears and the wheat come close to looking alike. But ultimately, it is God that we judge. We are not here to destroy anything. We are here to call on everyone to be discerning. If what you believe is not Christ, if what you are observing does not have Christ in it, it is a warning. And as the Lord leads by his spirit, we must come out from among them and be separate. That is the call to us. How would you respond to that call? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. And we pray for the leading of your spirit. For everyone that is watching us. For everyone that is listening to us. Spirit of the living God. Move. Amplify this truth. We have spoken briefly. But we trust that you will expound this truth. Bring conviction. Bring a turn around in the lives of these you people that many will be one to the kingdom. For you said in your word there is celebration in heaven for one that is lost and then comes back to the kingdom. We thank you for this harvest. We thank you for what you are doing even now. Be magnified and glorified. Great and mighty God that you are. Loving Father in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the preaching of your word. We pray Lord of glory. We have spoken briefly. We pray spirit of the living God that you amplify this truth within the hearing of your people. King of glory, move the best way you know how. Bring enlightenment to those darkened areas of our lives. Illuminate, Lord, those things that we have held on to that are not pleasing in your sight. Grant us the strength to be able to walk away from them. King of kings and Lord of glory, I pray for your people that as they consider this truth, a fresh light will light in their yes. That together, Lord, we may have to walk away from what we have to walk away from and move towards where you are calling us to. 
Tutambule nga tugende yo jyotu yita. That our lives will bring you glory. Obulambu afe bukulete lejitimu. That our lives will worship you. Obulambu afe bukulete lokusinza. That our lives will give you praise. Obulambu afe bukulete lejitimu. Both now and forevermore. Katine mirembe jona. In Jesus' name. Mulinye liya Yesu. Amen. 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 Thank you for watching us and listening to us today. From Dominion Church International. Dominion Church. Say shalom. God richly bless you. Amen. Amen.